and welcome back. Um, so I'm very excited to uh, welcome y'all and introduce you to my colleagues, Matt Kreif, Hannah Jardine, and Shad Silliman, uh, who will be holding a, a very a valuable, I believe, for all of you, workshop on the foundations for effective and inclusive teaching. Uh, and um, so I'm, I'm going to hand it over to Matt, Hannah, and Shad. All right, thank you, Anna. And I, I recognize everyone is coming back from lunch that was a little bit um, briefer than to be expected. So I imagine we'll have more people trickling in over time. Um, but good afternoon. Um, thanks for joining us for this um, longer portion of the um, new faculty orientation, but we will um, keep things moving and give you lots and lots of strategies to think about for going into teaching this semester. So I'm Hannah Jardine. I'm one of the teaching and learning specialists with CTRL, also an adjunct professor with the School of Education. Hi, um, can you all hear me? Give me a thumbs up or a excellent, thank you. My name is Shed, like the thing in your backyard. And I'm also a teaching and learning specialist at the CTRL and I go by she or they pronouns. And I am Matt Kreit, that first name on the list. Um, I am also a teaching and learning specialist here at CTRL, um, and I use they, them pronouns. And I'm just, I'm really excited to speak with you all today. All right, so us being teaching and learning specialists, um, one of our big goals for our sessions is to model effective and inclusive and participatory teaching practices. So we start all of our workshops um, with guidelines for participation. So throughout this workshop or throughout this portion of the orientation, we kindly ask that you first make yourself comfortable. I hope that you've been doing that throughout the day, but if not, just um, think about what makes you comfortable as you're participating. So stim, rock, fidget, knit, craft, et cetera, as needed or continue eating your lunch. Uh, be present. So participate in individual and group activities in a way that works for you. So we will have different points throughout our session where we'll ask you to put ideas in the chat, um, do some Zoom annotation, some other things. There will be an opportunity to even talk with colleagues if that's going to work for you. Um, asking questions or sharing ideas in the chat. So whoever isn't speaking, um, between Max, Shed, and I, we will um, look to answer any of your questions in the chat. Um, if you have something you want to say out loud, please use the raise hand function to speak, which is under reactions. And please be generous with your knowledge and respectful of other no others' knowledge. So we intend for this to be a space where you learn from us, but also learn from each other as you're all coming in with lots of experiences and expertise and thoughts about teaching and learning. So to start, we're really interested um, to get to know who's here and what you might be excited about um, when you're thinking about starting teaching this semester. So if you could open up the chat and introduce yourself, you could share your department or maybe a uh, um, course that you're teaching this semester and let us know what are you most excited about when it comes to teaching at AU this semester. I already see a question in the chat from Tom. Are we the team that um, you can obtain a mid-year evaluation from your students? Yes, and we at, towards the end of our session are going to go over all of the services that the teaching and learning specialists offer, that being one of them. So thank you for that question. Thank you, Sarah, for um, letting us know that you're excited about learning from your graduate students. Megan, small classes, absolutely. AU, it's relatively small classes if you've taught at other places, um, which is a real treat. Looking forward to teaching undergrads, excited to get to know your students. Um, Tom is excited to take their professional experience and apply it to their coursework and help students understand connections. Chaz, I love, love what you're saying here about working with law students who are mission and public interest driven. I'd say um, 
it's very common among students at AU and something that I really enjoy about working with students at AU. They're very mission and public interest driven. Some of you coming back to the classroom after time away. Awesome. Yeah, and connecting to the real world, Christine. Awesome. So thank you um, for those of you who let us know in the chat and um, helps us get to know who's here a little bit better. And feel free to continue to read what some of your colleagues are writing and thinking about what you're excited about. Uh, so we also, you'll get to know if you come to more and more of our events um, throughout the semester, we always start our sessions with learning outcomes, which we recommend you also do when you're teaching. Um, both you might have learning outcomes for your course, but also for individual class sessions that, so that students understand what the goals are for that class session and what you aim for them to get out of it. So by the end of this session, uh, we're aiming for you to be able to integrate strategies to make your teaching more effective, engaging, and equitable, that you will identify relevant teaching support resources and opportunities to engage with us, the CTRL teaching and learning team, and also that you'll have a few moments to connect with fellow instructors, even like what you're doing here in the chat, to start building community and a support system. So we're starting off the presentation with this quote from a book called What Inclusive Instructors Do to just present a general definition of inclusive teaching that will kind of frame the rest of the presentation. So inclusive teaching involves designing learning environments that are equitable, where all students have the opportunity to reach their potential and welcoming and that they foster a sense of belonging. So a few words here we bolded, inclusive, equitable, and welcoming. And we will define these in more detail throughout the presentation and talk about what does this look like and what can you do in your classrooms to aim for this. So another opportunity for us to be a little bit reflective and collaborative together and think about um, our goals for teaching this fall, uh, we're, we set up this slide to be an annotation activity. So what that means is that we're all going to kind of write on the blank space on this slide together. So we put this sentence together. I believe that blank is important in teaching today. So in order to add a word to the board, um, and you can add it anywhere in um, a blank space on the slide, at the top of your screen, you should see view options next to where it says, um, I think Hannah Jardine is, view, is sharing screen. So you click view options, then annotate and choose text to type your response. You can change the color of your text. Um, you could also choose to draw if you want to write it out in drawing. I see some words starting to come through. Diversity, compassion. Ooh, mindfulness, meaningful connection, excitement, being empathetic, another empathy. Mm, flexibility. Humility. And as, as we're continuing to see more words get added, I'll also just mention, um, we'll have many meta moments throughout the workshop where we talk about the strategies that we're showing you. So annotation is a really cool feature um, if you are teaching remotely um, to use on Zoom and setting up a slide in this way where you'd have students then add to the slide or interact with it. But you could also do this in person, say if you um, wanted to start class by writing a prompt on the whiteboard and have students as they enter class come up to the board and write some ideas and, and kind of have that collective um, interaction there together in writing or have different poster paper around the room, uh, a few other ways to do this with students. All right, so I see lots of great ideas. I see people adding stamps, maybe to second what other people are writing. That's really awesome. Um, so great words here. And I'm gonna save this uh, PDF so that we can share it with you later on when we share all the resources from this presentation.
I think we're stirring all of them. So we're in high agreement that these are some of our values we want to keep in mind for the fall. So see that if you do use annotation, you have to clear the drawings before moving on. So I'm gonna clear all of these drawings and then um, we'll share with you now our list, which compares, is very similar actually to the list you all just presented. Um, where are we here? Okay, so over the last few years, I think, and even prior to the pandemic, we've learned a lot about the importance of things like clarity, transparency, empathy. I remember that word coming up a lot into what you wrote, empowerment, belonging, flexibility. That was another one that had come up, connection, engagement, compassion. Uh, we've gotten better at doing all of these things. And these are all aspects of equitable and inclusive teaching and what we all aim for as teachers and learners at American University. So all of these words fit into uh, a model or a way of thinking about teaching and learning in terms of um, student-centered learning. So rather than thinking about what the content and centering the content of our discipline or centering us as teachers, we're centering students first and then choosing um, instructional strategies and content based on students. So we consider all these words aspects of a student-centered learning experience. So we could go into detail in regards to any of the words on the previous slide, but we chose to frame the rest of our session on three C's and hopefully that helps you remember them throughout the semester and come back to them. So clarity, compassion, and connection. Clarity being related to transparency and structure and Shed will go into more detail about clarity in a moment. Um, compassion related to flexibility and empathy, those words that you shared. Um, and Mac will go into compassion and then, um, also think about connection, which could mean many things, but today we'll talk about connection as it relates to engagement and student interaction. So with that quick introduction, before we get into what any of these words mean um, or strategies you can use to be more clear, compassionate and connected with your students, which of these is resonating most with you and why, or which one are you most interested in learning more about? I'm just curious you could add into the chat. And again, we will we will be covering all three, but we're just interested um, to see which ones are resonating. Clarity, connection, lots of connection. Yeah. Oh, Craig mentioning compassion because it seems that modern students are really sad or struggling a lot in their classes for lots of different reasons, obviously. Yeah, but thinking about what that looks like. Relationships matter, absolutely. All right. So before I pass it over to Shed, I will just say too that um, by asking a question like this, we're modeling something that you could think of as say a pre-assessment or um, kind of asking students to pause and reflect about something before you start to go into it, which then leads them more ready to take on that new information once you jump into it. Um, so definitely a strategy you might try in your classes this semester, asking students to think about something before you present it in more detail. All right, anything else uh, before we move on? Anything we're seeing in the chat, Mac or Shed, that you want to? I would love to, oh, sorry. I would love to highlight, um, Craig made a great point about how, and which you highlighted, how how people are pretty down right now and not just the students. Sarah beat me to this point perfectly, which was also us, we are tired and it is tiring to support others through their trauma and um, challenges. So Sarah asked how to prevent compassion fatigue. Actually, tomorrow morning, 
Uh, Catherine Manning, who's a faculty member, and I will be doing a workshop on trauma-informed teaching for our August faculty workshops. And she will be talking about compassion fatigue in that session. So definitely encourage you to attend if you're interested in that topic. And also, we're really happy to share the materials from it if you can't make it. Um, so perfect timing, Sarah. Uh, your check is in the mail. <laughs> All right. So Shed, you can get us started on clarity. Excellent. All right. So let's talk about what clarity means to our students and why it's important. So why is it important? First of all, reducing cognitive overload. We know that our students can only hold so much, right? Uh, that they're processing or absorbing new information only so much at a time, like anyone, and remembering that students have multiple classes that they're taking at once, typically. So uh, being clear is going to save us and them from having to um, spend time figuring out what's being asked of them, defining expectations. It saves you some emails and maybe some office hour visits. Um, it helps you, your students understand the how and why behind your instruction instructional decisions. Uh, so if you've ever worried, you know, you've had students complain about busy work, or you even dealt with busy work as a student, usually students think something is busy work because they don't understand what purpose it serves for the course, and they feel like it's just an arbitrary assignment to fill their time. By being clear with them about why they're doing the assignment and how it helps them develop skills for the course, it's going to improve student motivation to complete the assignment. It also helps uncover what we call the hidden curriculum. Uh, give me a thumbs up if you've heard of that before, or maybe you could share in the chat if you've heard of it before, or maybe you're totally new to that idea of the hidden curriculum. I see some thumbs up. Maybe some of us are like, I've never heard of that before. That's all right. So this is a term that we use to describe the unwritten and often unspoken rules of succeeding in higher education or really in all education. And a lot of these things, um, a student may not show up knowing those hidden curriculum guidelines, um, like what does good participation look like? Or when should they visit office hours? We may assume our students already know these things, but that does a, assume a certain amount of privilege the student might have where they already know what is expected of them in class, maybe because they have family members who went to college and have already advised them on how to behave, or they got to take some pre-college courses or something like that. Um, so we don't want to put our mar more marginalized students at a disadvantage, for example, first gen students, um, to figure out what that hidden curriculum is. Second thing to keep in mind is every class is different. Participation is going to look different in your class than any other class, and your office hour rules are going to be different too. So we need to clarify them for our students so they're not guessing what we want from them. And of course, being clear, being transparent, research shows that it increases, increases students' academic confidence or their self-efficacy to you know, face uh, problems or practice new skills. Uh, it gives them a better sense of mastery of the skill that they're working on, and it can improve their overall academic performance. So how do we implement clarity? Well, through a very clear structure and organization. So you may be building your Canvas course or syllabus out or figuring out some last details this week. Um, so here are some things you can do to um, bring clarity to your course structure. Sending regular reminders, such as a weekly announcement or a to-do list with deadlines and requirements. This could be helpful not just for your students, but for you to keep on track and keep attention on your schedule. Um, you could share an agenda or an outline for each class session so students know what the goal of that lesson is and what they're supposed to be taking away from it. It also helps to follow a consistent weekly rhythm. Students consistently tell us that they love this. They love when the class has a sort of regular pattern um, where, you know, the due dates are kind of at a regular time or every class starts and ends with, you know, a check-in or the, you know, every you know, second class of the week is a discussion. Something like that is can really help your students stay focused. 
Um, creating a simple structure for organizing materials in Canvas. Another big piece of feedback we get is students struggling to navigate through Canvas to find what their instructors are directing them to. And so keeping it simple, something I'm going to recommend if you haven't already, is clicking on student view in Canvas and looking at your course from a student's perspective. It looks super different from when you're creating it and it's very helpful. And then be clear about expectations for all assignments and activities, large and small. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but I do want to highlight that these are all trauma-informed approaches. And if you want to read more, I, rec I recommend reading this great article that's linked here by Carello and Butler on trauma-informed teaching. But transparency is very important to trauma-informed teaching to help people feel like there is sort of a, uh, there's a reliable routine to the course and they won't be surprised by their grades or by assignments. So in that way, it's very trauma-informed. So clarifying expectations for assignments, how do we do that? Well, you can, we can use what is called TILT, trans, oh no, I always forget what the I stands for in TILT. Eh, transparent, in. what is it? In, it's just in. It's just in, it's a preposition, that's sad. All right, well, transparency in learning and teaching. Thank you, Matt. So um, transparent assignment design, or there's a sort of idea of it called tilt that we've linked through these slides. The idea of just being really clear with students about the purpose of the assignment. Why am I doing it? How is it supporting my learning? How is it connected to the learning outcomes? Again, that helps challenge the sort of busy work label being clear about the task. So what are the components that you would turn in? What are the due dates for each component? If it's got multiple parts, when does each part do and what should each component include? How are they graded? Criteria, so expectations for evaluation, such as a rubric. Students often ask for rubrics so they can understand um, what they can improve or what's missing from their assignment in their in the draft. Um, so a good question is, how do I know whether I've been successful with this assignment? Your student, theoretically, what we would like is for them to have a pretty good idea of what grade they're going to get before they turn it in. If they're if a lot of students are very surprised by the grade that they get, then we want to look back at our expectations and how they might be clearer for students. Uh, Hannah, Mac, anything you would add here to clarity? All right. And Mac has shared the tilt resource in the in the chat. Excuse me. I was gonna say, I think the another um, you've talked a lot about why this is really valuable for students, Shed, and that's absolutely true. But I've also heard a lot of faculty say as they're going through this process, especially the part where you're having to define the purpose, um, that's where you can check yourself too and think oh, is there really a purpose for me doing this assignment? And that can be kind of a self-assessment in terms of, should I really restructure this? Or if I can't explain the purpose, then I know that I need to rethink this assignment and make it more clear for myself as the instructor as well. <laughs> Yeah, so we might say to ourselves something like, oh, well, they, you know, they have to write a, an, uh, a clear analysis. What does that mean? That means a different thing for every instructor in every class. So really clarifying with them, what do I mean when I say a lit review, an annotated bibliography, an essay, all of that. All right, and I will pass it over for Compassion. Thanks, Shed. Um, so as many of you probably noticed or mentioned or are already thinking about um, when we asked about those C's that you really liked, uh, compassion is important to you all um, and it's important to us and it's key to equitable teaching. It centers around um, trying to be aware of and treating students as people um, with lives outside of our courses and it also includes realizing that you're a person with a life outside of your job here at AU. So being compassionate can include being compassionate to your students, but also being compassionate to yourself. So as you'll see, we'll share lots and lots of strategies with you. Some will work, some won't. So feel free to just take those that are really valuable to you as we go throughout all of these strategies that we're sharing here. Um, I think it's important just to note that we've all been through a lot recently. And like uh, one of our participants shared in the chat, um, you know, students have been through a lot and there's some, um, there's just a lot of a lot of things going on in the world, and it's really important to try to promote flexibility, trust, and grace, which can help us promote these equitable learning environments that we're really interested in doing. 
So why is compassion com important? Sorry, my computer just messed up. Um, so why is compassion important? Um, and compassion is important because it's essential to being inclusive, welcoming, and respectful in our classrooms. And it helps to cultivate this positive classroom climate, which can increase students' sense of belonging, motivation, and generally overall academic performance. When we create classrooms that have these positive classroom climates, students know they're supported and this increases their ability to learn. We can also have deeper, more meaningful, and more rigorous conversations and discussions with our students in a way that we wouldn't really be able to if students were wary and nervous to speak, uh, to speak and participate in class. So what I want to do now is share a quote from one of our uh, CTRL student partners. So recently, CTRL has hired a few undergraduate students to work directly with us and provide their insights into um, their experiences as students at AU and develop some projects and some guidance for instructors uh, that they think would be really important for instructors to know. So this quote came uh, as a result of a conversation that these student partners have with us every, roughly every week during the semester. Um, they talk about various things. Uh, sometimes it's about compassion. Sometimes it's about, you know, how do we avoid burnout at the end of the semester? It's a wide range of topics and they're really, really insightful. And we like to share their, uh, their insights with you all. So what Reba and Kamaya uh, have said here is that we hope to encourage a classroom culture that follows an etiquette of care and respect for both the educator and students. This culture requires an inclusive framework and a conscientious approach to student learning. It is important that both students and educators take accountability for their own learning while also providing those opportunities for learning to happen. So that really highlights that we need to take accountability and we need to work together uh, as instructors and with our students in order to develop these learning environments where we can be compassionate and where we can be flexible and trust, uh, trust ourselves and our students. So how might we demonstrate care and compassion in our classes? Um, one of the ways that we can do it is we can be aware of our students' commitments outside of class. So be aware of those students' practicalities. So you could do this by um, encouraging or even potentially requiring one-to-one uh, -one meetings during office hours early in the semester. Um, this can be helpful to get to know students and lower that barrier to office hour attendance. Um, it can also promote that clarity that Shed mentioned. Um, so students know that it's, it's okay to come to office hours, that you actually want them there. Some students have even said, I don't know what office hours are. I thought that was the time when the professor was in their, in their office just doing their own work. I didn't know that I was allowed to be there. And so if you require these types of meetings, students know that you want them there, that you want to be there to help them. Um, you can also do something similar. If you have a larger class, it may be uh, not reasonable to be able to meet with each student. So perhaps a survey at the beginning of class um, could be really helpful. So you can ask you know, very general demographic information, uh, name you use, pronouns, things like that. Um, but outside of that general information that you ask, you can also ask your students uh, various, um, let's say, tone setting questions, such as questions about their learning environment or anything they're nervous about with the course. So this kind of prop um, prompts them to begin reflecting and prepping for that course and can help them uh, and can help you be aware of, you know, again, those practicalities. One of the questions that I really enjoy asking is, is there anything you would like me to know about your learning environment this semester? And from this question, I get just a huge range of responses from students disclosing homelessness to students disclosing that they have ADHD or even just that they're really excited about the course. And so that open-ended question lets me know a lot more about my students. You can also let your uh, students know that you're there to support them by adding something like an empathy or a mental health statement on your syllabus. Um, this describes your personal approach to being flexible and empathetic and compassionate with your students. Um, so for instance, one that you might say is life happens, challenges may arise. My role as your instructor is here to support you um, while still high, holding you to high standards of uh, performance and professionalism. Please reach out to me as soon as you can if you need assistance or uh, extensions. So related to having these kind of empathy or mental health statements on your syllabus, you also uh, should be very flexible and transparent with your policies. Um, so you, like Shed mentioned, you can be transparent about why you have certain expectations or requirements. 
And it's really important to note here, and I'm gonna to pause to be a little slower, um, that it is not unkind and it's not inequitable to have policies or boundaries. It's very important for you as an instructor to have boundaries and to hold to those boundaries and hold them firm with students. However, what we advocate for is sharing with your students or even potentially working with your students to develop those policies and why you have policies laid out the way that they are. That can help them understand your reasoning behind those policies that you have and why it's important to um, follow, for example, your late work policy. Maybe you have an assignment that has to be turned in on a certain day because of you need to provide feedback by, to your students by a certain time. If you share that with them, then they know, okay, I, there's no flexibility in this due date. I have to have my assignment in on this day for this reason. And that's okay to hold students to those standards. Again, of course, being you know open if something, <laughs> something wild happens, we still wanna be responsive and flexible, but you, know, you, can, you can hold students to standards. Um, some other things that we'd like to mention are building in flexibility and trust into your course. So you can consider offering choice to students by providing materials in multiple formats or offering potentially options for assessments. I think some people mentioned, uh, talked about options for assessments earlier this semester, or earlier this semester, earlier today, earlier in the session. Um, and these are also in line with some universal design for learning principles. And we'll go a little bit more into what universal design for learning means uh, once we get to kind of the second portion of our session today. Could also consider thinking about uh, due date flexibility by offering something like a late work token or potentially a deadline range. So what a late work token is, is when uh, at the beginning of the semester, say you say everyone gets five tokens that they can use to turn in an assignment 48 hours late. Students have uh, those tokens and they know that they can use them and it can be really helpful for some of our shy, more introverted or uh, non-traditional students because they know that they're allowed to use those tokens and they're allowed to ask for those extensions um, in a way that they may not feel comfortable doing if they're uh, if they're not as familiar with the college system. You could consider attendance policy flexibility by offering a few free absences. Um, some folks use those tokens similarly to uh, give people absences over the semester. And then I always advocate for exploring at least uh, alternative grading policies so these are things like ungrading, where you basically entirely remove uh, grades from the course and use process letters or conversations with students to develop those final letter grades that you do have to input into the AU system. Um, and there are other types of alternative grading systems like contract grading, specifications grading, uh, portfolio-based grading. There's a lot of really great variety out there. Um, and we'll be sharing a resource about these alternative grading practices and are always happy to chat about them with you. And with that, uh, I have not been looking at the chat at all. So if there's anything that we need to address, is there anything there, Shutter, Hannah? We're good. Yep. All right. Letting you know all the links are in there. Already. Great. Thank you. <laughs> um, and then Hannah, I think you're you're good to go. Yeah. All right. And our third C was connection. Uh, which is, again, a very broad term, but what we're meaning here is this idea of connection to content, connection to the instructor, and connection to other students. So seeing those as kind of the, we might call it the three-legged stool or the three pillars of um, teaching and learning, and that students need to connect to all three of those things um, to have deep and meaningful learning. So connection increases engagement and active participation, which leads to deeper processing and understanding. Uh, improving students' critical thinking, problem solving, collaboration, and creativity, all of those skills that are so valuable um, that we want to make sure students are gaining from our courses. Uh, I have another quote from a CTRL student partner, um, and this student partner is talking about how all learners are a bit different. So students learn differently. No one learner consumes knowledge and information the same way, something we always wanna keep in mind. So if students are not giving the, given the opportunity to engage in dialogue, ask questions, or share their own ideas and perspectives, then their learning and development in that classroom is limited. So what this student is communicating is that if we're doing all the talking, or if the content is doing all of the talking, um, or the interacting, or the, the thinking, really, then students are going to be limited into what they're learning. So... The next few slides will introduce some ideas of how we can actively engage our students during class. 
So first connection during lecture. Uh, we do want to communicate that lecturing does not hurt learning, but students learn better when actively engaged during lecture. So there were, are definitely times where we will be presenting material to our students as the experts in our disciplines, um, potentially through a lecture, but there are ways we can engage with students during a lecture. So for example, um, starting class with a poll or maybe inserting polls throughout class that either ask for students' opinions on things, ask students to um, say maybe guess about what the right answer might be before you present information or even quizzing students after you present information to assess um, how well they were listening and, and retaining the information. Um, using reactions, so this could happen in person or online, online using the Zoom reactions feature or in person just taking a pause um, after you've done a bunch of talking and saying, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down or thumbs sideways, how are we feeling right now? Um, and kind of reading the room and seeing um, how students are expressing their reactions to the material and, and seeing if there's anything you need to revisit. Uh, directed paraphrasing is um, a way of asking students to say either, either internally or in writing um, or to appear, stop, pause, and, and paraphrase what we just said, um, potentially even asking them to take a certain perspective. So for example, um, if we were to do this during this workshop, we might say, okay, now pause and think about if you were to explain to your, um, to a colleague what the three C's were and, or why clarity is important or why compassion is important, uh, what would you say? So just practicing your ability to retain the information and synthesize and summarize it on the spot to, to deepen the learning there. Um, any type of pause and reflect. So like we've been doing throughout this workshop, um, just stopping at certain moments to get uh, students or learners to reflect on what you're saying and engage with that or apply the information for some individual quick writes. Um, that could uh, especially be valuable at the end of class. And sometimes we refer to these as exit tickets where students are individually reflecting and summarizing and responding to a question at the end of class um, to solidify their learning. And that could be handwritten or uh, potentially submitted via a Google form or a Google Doc or on Canvas, whatever is going to work for you and your students. Um, thinking about all of the different tools that are accessible to us for these things. So when we're thinking about individual participation, if you are teaching remotely, you might use the Zoom chat. Uh, but teaching in person, there are both digital tools and non-digital tools you might use. So uh, free softwares like Poll Everywhere or Padlet are great ways to get students participating during class where they can go to a, a specific link you give them after you set it up and um, open up their laptops and then enter their answer to a question. Uh, Google Docs, great way to get students working together during class sessions. A lot of faculty occurred do say um, collaborative note taking. So each class session, they might set up a Google Doc where uh, their students are taking notes and there's those notes are shared across the class or they have group activities where all students have to add some ideas to the Google Doc. Lots of opportunities there. Um, and then, of course, sticky notes, index cards, pen and paper are sometimes also valuable for different reasons. Um, and getting students to put their ideas more informally on paper, sticky notes and index cards have the ability to say sort or, or categorize or group across themes, those sorts of things. Okay. Um, so that was kind of connection to the content or connection during lecture, then connecting to you as the instructor. So building connections with students as the instructor is super critical. Um, I think there's someone who put in the chat before, relationships are key, right? So you can connect with your students by integrating their identities and differences into the course by getting to know them, like Mac talked about with the um, survey at the beginning of the semester or any point in the semester, letting them make choices, maybe in terms of how they um, present their understanding or um, what kind of topics you explore together as a class. One way to empower students is to provide opportunities for co-creation. So for example, choosing content together, developing classroom norms together, as we've talked about, creating assignment rubrics together, um, and certainly asking students what matters to them and what they want to learn and in the context of your course. 
Also asking students for their feedback, especially on how things are working for them in the course and apply that feedback. So at the beginning of the session, I think someone mentioned um, our service in terms of mid-semester course analyses where we can come in and gather feedback from your students, but also we highly encourage instructors at the mid-semester point or really any time in the semester to just ask your students um, formally, informally, anonymously or not, um, just how things are going, what's working well for you, what might we change, what can we work together to improve. Um, we tried this new activity, how did it go, should we do it again, how can we make it better. So um, working with your students to make the class as productive and uh, successful as possible. And then lastly, um, thinking about interaction and collaboration amongst students. So student-student interaction and collaboration is a huge part of connection and effective inclusive teaching. Social connections, research shows motivate students, provide opportunities for deeper learning, increase that sense of belonging. Uh, if you're remote, certainly Zoom breakout rooms are a great way to support community and interaction. Um, in person or online, you could use Google Docs, Google Jamboard, or other technology tools to support collaboration and give students a chance to share ideas and writing as well as out loud. And then lastly, there's a graphic on here that we've labeled Think, Pair, Share, um, which is a bit more informal and can happen relatively quickly, especially in person. So this graphic demonstrates how Think, Pair, Share works, uh, but I'll talk through it. So essentially that first bubble is asking students to think on their own about a question related to the course content, then pairing them off or putting them in small groups. Um, if you're online, potentially in breakout rooms to talk with each other and then come back to share as a whole class. And what you can see in the in the picture, we have one Lego block from one student, then a pair of students has two Lego blocks, and then the class comes together to build a whole um, set of Lego blocks. So demonstrating the value of coming together to share ideas. Um, the strategy also helping students to form ideas and build confidence before going into a larger class setting. So I think the classic instructor move when we have a question we wanna ask class is just to ask the class a question. Um, and then we're often faced with either the same students who always raise their hands are raising their hands or um, nobody raises their hands. So I think pair share can be a great way to get more students talking or to get the students who don't normally talk to still engage with that question. Um, I haven't been monitoring the chat, but Shed or Mac, is there anything to, to bring up? Or are there more, seems like people are just sharing really awesome ideas and, and other resources and tools and strategies. So that's awesome to see. And thank you for that. All right, so I will hand it back over to Mac to kind of wrap up this section. Sure, yeah. So uh, just noting that there's a lot of a lot of strategies and ideas being shared in that chat. So if you are uh, able to access that, uh, definitely uh, recommend checking that out as we're chatting, as we're talking, and you will also have access to that after the session uh, as a part of the recording. Um, so back to the back to the uh, session. Um, we did just go through a lot of information um, and a lot of ideas and strategies for creating and centering students and creating our student-centered classrooms. Um, so what we want to do now is do another um, little check in a little pause and reflect uh, where you all can tell us how you're thinking differently about these three C's now. So in the chat, feel free to share um, in what ways are you thinking differently about the three C's and this can be super broad, it can be like I just like this C more than I did before. Um, so anything that you're really thinking uh, we're we're excited to hear it. This can also be a great tool um, going into the meta mode, uh, a great thing to do after you present a lot of information to students. You can just kind of see what they took from it, what they are thinking about differently, what they valued, maybe what they're still confused about. And these types of questions can really help you get almost immediate feedback on your teaching and how it's connecting with your students.
also thinking about how these concepts overlapped a bunch, which I think we tried to point out. Um, it's, it's even hard to just divide the information into these uh, three categories because we could make arguments for different things to be in different categories. But what's really important instead is that these are all really valuable strategies and you can pick the ones that are that are useful to you. All right, so I think in the interest of time, uh, feel free to start keep adding how you're thinking differently about the three C's, but I think we'll go on to our next um, portion. So what we're gonna ask you now, uh, or what we're gonna do now is offer you the opportunity to collaborate with your colleagues. So in small um, breakout rooms, we're going to uh, ask you these, uh, these two questions. So which of the strategies presented might you try this semester and what impact do you think that it will have on your students? You can also think about the question, what makes you feel included in a learning space and how can you recreate that for students? We'll note that we've put some uh, uh guiding norms at the bottom of the screen so listen actively make space for all to share and be open-minded um someone helpfully mentioned that we typically would suggest or that they typically do this with students at the beginning of class and that is certainly what we would suggest um, however in a short session we don't have time to collaborately generate those norms so we've provided some uh to you that we generally find to be helpful as we structure discussions so I believe the uh, the instructions for this activity are in the chat here. Hannah just uh, mentioned them, so you'll be able to have those questions go with you as you go into the breakout rooms, which is another helpful strategy to use if you're teaching online. Um, and with that, I uh, are the breakout rooms ready? Yeah, and we will say that if you are um, if you are not um, planning to go into room, please don't leave the session because we do have a lot more content for you after, but you're welcome to just stay in the main room and reflect on these questions yourself. But we did wanna give the opportunity for people to meet some colleagues and discuss some of these ideas if that is something you're interested in. So again, feel free to stay in the main room rather than leave this session.
the breakout rooms are closed next. All right, thank you. I couldn't, I, I didn't know if everybody was coming back. Um, so thank you all for uh, participating in those breakout rooms. And I hope those of you that stayed in the uh, same, in the main room had a chance to reflect on some of these questions on your own. Um, what we'd ask now is just to do like a really short debrief. So maybe um, one or two of the people who were in uh, groups who were had that chance to collaborate with their colleagues, or even if you stayed in that main room, um, what did you get out of your conversation? Were there any key takeaways that you'd like to share with the main group? Um, and you can feel free to share those key takeaways either in the chat or by raising uh, your hand and we'll call on you to speak. Uh, yeah, Sarah, go ahead. So we were talking in my room about um, different experiences that we've had before coming to AU and how we might shift our approach based on the student populations here. We got into some discussions about how to be compassionate, uh, but also providing clarity and firm deadlines and kind of setting our own boundaries so that we're not taken advantage of, but um, being kind and clear with students. So we were talking about that from different disciplinary viewpoints. Awesome, thank you so much for sharing that. I think it's really valuable to note that you can set boundaries and you can still be kind and you can still do that in a way that's compassionate and flexible and student-centered, but also, you're still a person. <laughs> Instructors are people too. Um, and it's really important to keep in mind that your mental health matters, your wellness matters, and your ability to continue to do this work matters. So thank you so much, Sarah, for mentioning that and, and sharing that uh, resource or sharing that insight and also just being willing to, uh, to speak. It can be hard to speak in some of these big meetings, so we appreciate it. Um, so with that, I think we have we have some more content uh, to go over. So I think I'm going to hand it back over to Shed uh, to talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. All right. Thank you, Mac. All right. So <laughs> there's a lot of frameworks that we have brought up and we will bring up. And these are all frameworks that can contribute to and are sort of interwoven with equitable teaching. So you'll see we've already mentioned trauma-informed pedagogy. We're going to talk about UDL, universal design for learning. We've also been thinking about active learning and social and emotional learning. All of these are intertwined. There's not a sort of finite uh, definition or graph of equitable teaching that we can present because it's sort of complex and shifting. Um, but let's try and understand what we mean by equity. So what do we mean by these terms? I'm sure you've heard them plenty of times, uh, maybe as DEIJ, or I've heard people re, uh, reform it as JEDI, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. So I'm going to offer you this tool as a way of thinking about these four terms. This is just one way to think about it. These are popular terms, which means everyone's got a different definition for them. But this is just one way of thinking about it that can be helpful for us when it comes to teaching. So we're thinking about this as a spectrum from left to right and that they scaffold on top of each other. Diversity being the least involved or engaging action and justice being the most involved or engaging action, but there's things, you know, that we could add on top of justice or there's points before diversity that maybe are a little less engaged or effective. Um, and those are sort of extra points, but for now, let's focus on these four. So if we could, perfect. Thank you, Hannah. So here are some phrases or some statements to sort of reflect what we mean by each term. With diversity, we are recognizing difference. We are pointing it out. So the expression would be, there are many different people, perspectives, identities at AU. Diversity is the presence of difference, but it isn't an action, really. It's not a sort of, uh, it, it doesn't mean that everyone feels included or welcome. It just means different people are together. So diversity is 
really not quite enough for us. When we want students to feel included, we build on diversity with inclusion. So the statement would be, we invite valid, rational, non-dominant people perspectives, identities at AU. So that's not just saying there is difference and we recognize difference with diversity, but that we are trying to include across difference. So it's not just people who tend to fit a norm or a more privileged position who feel welcome. I want to note here, though, the use of the terms valid and rational. And that the reason that that's in here is that often it is folks from a marginalized community who are similar or who can approximate the uh, majority community or the community in power that get to be included. So for example, aligning with respectability politics or perhaps uh, someone who express, you know, who can kind of fit into a majority structure. Um, so we wanna keep in mind that we want to accept all kinds of difference and include all kinds of difference, not just when people express themselves in a way we're familiar with, but exploring other ways of expressing, expressing valid thought and rational thought. So we're not just recognizing diversity and including people across it. When we get to equity, we're trying to address the unequal distribution of resources and power. Equity should not be confused with equality. When people ask for equality, they're asking for everyone to have the same things. But we know everyone doesn't need the same things. A great example would be COVID tests. So the U.S. government had distributed different COVID tests uh, at the sort of first round that that happened during the pandemic and gave the same amount to every household. But not every household needs the same amount of tests, right? I'm a single person by myself. I don't need like eight tests. And then there's some families that need eight tests, right? But they don't get enough. So that's why we want to think in terms of equity. People need different things because our systems leave people. They, they bring people to us with different amounts of resources and access, different opportunities. We want to try and even it out. So with equity, we address biases that lead to the dominance or invisibility of different people perspectives and identities at AU. So we know that not everyone comes to us, not every student comes to us with the same background, with the same financial experience, with the same academic experience. Perhaps they are struggling with different things that are happening in their life that they cannot afford course materials or they cannot always show up to class on time because they are caring for someone in their family. So we wanna to try to address that in an equitable way because we know our students all need different things and try and offer them options and flexibility like Mac is going to talk about. So. If we want to build on all of that, we're not just recognizing difference with diversity, we're not just including across difference with inclusion, and we're not just distributing resources and opportunities so that more people have access to them who didn't. With justice, we are asking, why is it like this? Why are resources and power distributed unequally? How come some students can't afford their next meal? And meanwhile, you know, some students are not worried about that at all, right? Why does this inequity exist? And that is justice. Justice is questioning the structures themselves and the systems and asking, can we change them? Can we make them better? Can we get rid of a system that produces inequality and so or inequity? So with justice, the statement would be, we challenge policies that reinforce the dominance or invisibility of people, perspectives, and identities at you, AU. So that's backing up to ask, how is a system producing the inequity and how can we challenge that? If you go to our next slide, Hannah. Thank you. So to put it quite simply, uh, Diversity is acknowledging difference. Inclusion is including across difference. Equity is trying to make up for a lack of resources or how they're distributed due to difference. And difference is not bad. Difference is good. But difference is treated as a reason to not give people certain opportunities or resources. And then justice is challenging the systems which manufacture difference. So I want to provide a quick example of what one sort of question of inclusion or equity DEIJ looks across the spectrum. So let's say students experiencing homelessness. Unfortunately, a lot of students experience housing insecurity, meaning they don't have a stable home to live in or complete homelessness, not having anywhere to go. Students will often get creative by uh, finding places to stay in things like public libraries or gyms, uh, 
couch surfing, things like that. And so we know that students are dealing with this, and we know that we are going to inevitably have students who struggle with housing insecurity, and usually as an extension, they do not have a stable source of food in their life or nourishment. So we're thinking in terms of diversity, I would be saying there are students who deal with housing insecurity on campus. That would just be pointing it out. That's diversity but it doesn't do anything to help those students be more engaged. Inclusion would be finding ways to include those students. Can we offer support services? Somewhere in my syllabus, I could note that there are food pantries or that there are opportunities for um, you know, some sort of uh, housing that they can look into or some sort of support, right? When we come to equity then, we're not just acknowledging it and we're not just trying to include those students. We're trying to address the inequity that's present. And so maybe I would say, hey, I know that some of my students are going to face a financial barrier to this class. So I'm not going to require students to buy textbooks for this class. And that would be recognizing the inequity and trying to address it. Or there are other things that you can do like help students find a text in the library, provide online readings and PDFs. You could ask students to recycle their textbooks at the end of the semester instead of selling it back. Maybe they'll uh, pass it down to another student who will need it. Um, there's a lot of different options. So we can try to address that. And then justice would be asking why are some students experiencing homelessness, right? And um, why are we doing that? <laughs> why is that happening when some people don't have to think about that at all, right? And how can we change that? Can we look at how how money is distributed or how students are being supported, what financial services they're being offered, that kind of thing. So that's a pretty comprehensive look, but this is just one way to think about it. If you get advanced. So now we're going to ask you to do another annotation with us. And I'm going to ask you this question, and there is no right answer. This is really for your reflection. Where would you place your teaching on the spectrum? And as you're thinking about that, I want you to keep in mind that this is a process and that we're always improving and we're always getting better. So it's not a finite thing where we reach, you know, we do equity and then we're done. We are always improving because our world is changing and we're changing. So we have to change too. So go ahead. And this is, you know, whatever's, whatever feels most um, the right for you, where would you put yourself? Use the stamp feature on annotate. So you go under view options and then annotate. And where do you place yourself? And no matter where you are, we just want to keep getting better, right? We want to move right on the spectrum. I know I always try to draw and it's quite a challenge. You think you think it's like drawing with a pencil, but as soon as you touch the mouse, you know, you know it's not. All right, excellent. And like I said, there's no right answers. The point is to recognize where we are so that we can learn new strategies. So I got some around diversity, some around inclusion. I see a lot around equity, which is really exciting. Someone just did a did an arrow. I love that from equity to justice. Beautiful, right? And like I said, there's not a finite end. I love, I love the variety. We're all at different places and maybe we're at different places for different issues. Maybe you feel like you understand how to be accessible in an equitable way really well, but maybe you don't feel as familiar with, um, let's say, addressing transphobia in your classroom. So um, that's something for you to think about. How can I move from diversity to inclusion or inclusion to equity on that topic? So thank you for sharing those reflections. And now I'm going to clear all the drawings, sorry. And I'm gonna turn it over to Mac to talk about implementing this knowledge with Universal Design for Learning. There we go. Thanks, Shed. Um, so I think Shed was, was hinting at this question, which is the question of how do we move further right with our strategies? So maybe not. Uh, so how do we move further right on that spectrum from diversity, inclusion, equity, justice? One of the ways that we like to suggest uh, that people do this and move towards equity or justice, if that's the goal for your course, is through implementing universal design. So universal design is the design of products and environments to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for adaptation or specialized design. This was originally developed in, in uh, architecture field, so that's why you see products environments, um, but there is an application to learning that we'll get to in just a sec. 
Um, but when universal design was first developed in architecture, they designed and developed these seven key principles. So the first is equitable. So is the learning experience or does the learning experience provide the same? And here we'll note that identical is better than equivalent, but sometimes equivalent is what you can do. Um, so does it provide the same means of access for all students? Is the learning environment flexible? So can this learning experience accommodate a range of individual preferences and abilities? Is it simple and intuitive? So is the learning experience easy to engage with regardless of prior uh, experience, language skill, or even perhaps level of concentration? Is it perceptible? Does the learning experience provide multiple and likely redundant modes of communication? Is it error tolerant? Does the learning experience minimize the hazards or consequences of student error or accidents, or even perhaps instructor error? I think lots of us make mistakes as we teach, and that's okay, that's expected. We're all learning, and even being able to point out and mention to your students when you've made mistakes or when you've learned something uh, that you can then apply to your teaching, that can be a really valuable educational moment for your students. And then in terms of uh, these, I would say these last two are likely more important for designing products and environments, but they're still really key to keep in mind as we teach, which are, um, is the learning experience uh, require low physical effort? So can the learning experience or classroom minimize fatigue and promote ease of use and comfort? So for example, you may have a classroom that is in a building such as Hearst, which is the building that CTRL is, CTRL is located in. And this is not an accessible building. There's no elevator. And so that's something that we have to keep in mind as we're developing programming for us is that we can't hold it in CTRL because then not everyone can access it in the same way that our uh, classrooms need to be in spaces that are accessible to all of our students. And then finally, is there size and space for approach and use? So is there appropriate size and space provided in the learning environment for approach, reach, manipulation, and use of the classroom learning environment regardless of a user's body size, posture, or mobility. So again, getting into that same, uh, those same concerns and those same things that we think about when it comes to accessibility of our learning spaces. A great example of universal design is this idea of a curb cut. So a curb cut is when you have a, um, a curb that goes into the street. So you have a sidewalk and you have a curb and there's usually that, uh, that ledge there. But a curb cut is when that ledge is cut into and you can eat and it, uh, it develops a ramp that goes down uh, into the street from the sidewalk. And so what we're showing you here is an image of a curb cut. And we have some alt text, which I think you heard about earlier this morning um, as to the, the importance of including alt text, but it's just a description of the picture. And that's what alt text is. It's description of images for those who can't access the images. And so I'll read it um, so that you can see and hear what a curb cut is. So a brightly lit cut curb, which shows a ramp from the sidewalk to an adjoining street with blue paint along the curb and a textured raised area before the ramp reaches street level. Sidewalks, trees, and flower beds are visible in the background. So the reason that a curb cut is a really great example of universal design and uh, accessible design is that this isn't adding anything to the sidewalk. It's there for anyone to use regardless of why they may need it. So for example, um, people who use mobility aids may find this useful. Folks that need vision assistance use those little raised bumps um, to uh, tell them when they're close to the street. Um, people who use strollers might find this useful so that they don't have to like pull their stroller over a big curb. People who have little dogs who can't jump over that curb may also find it useful so that their dogs aren't face diving onto the, onto the side, onto the street. So this, uh, this type of um, design is really valuable because it includes all of those different people and all of those different needs from the beginning. There's no change that's been made here. Instead, that cut curb is there and it's there for all to use and we're not adapting it to make it better. It's just there and that's how it was originally designed. Now, if we think about universal design in terms of learning, there are three categories that we think about when it comes to universal design for learning. So the first is the, and they're all related to providing multiple means, so multiple paths to success. So the first is to think about providing multiple means of engagement. So multiple means of engagement can tap into learners' interests, challenge them appropriately, 
and motivate them to learn. So an example might be allowing students to choose the topic that they want to do for a final assessment or letting them pick a topic for a particular lecture or class session. Maybe you have a class session that doesn't have a lecture title right now and you use your students' uh, interests and um, abilities to decide what that uh, topic will be. You can also provide multiple means of representation. So this is to give learners various ways of acquiring information and knowledge. So here an example would be uh, a very simple example is providing uh, any sort of lecture slides in a PowerPoint as well as a PDF form, or potentially including an ebook or an audiobook as a part of your uh, in class textbook. So some people can read a textbook, a physical textbook really well, and some people can't. So providing those options uh, allows people to choose the one that works best for them and can best support their learning. And then finally, uh, Universal Design for Learning promotes providing multiple means of action and expression. So this is to provide learners with alternatives for demonstrating what they know. So here you may think about offering different modes of participation. So maybe some folks really enjoy speaking and other folks really prefer to, uh, to not speak and maybe type. And if your learning outcomes are related to recognizing content, then they can share that they've understood or learned that content via speaking or via chat. But what's really important to note is that UDL isn't about changing your learning outcomes. So if it's really important for your students to be able to give a presentation or to be able to speak up in class, maybe you're giving a communication class, then those learning outcomes should stay the same. And the mode that students use to demonstrate that they've learned those learning outcomes should stay, uh, stay the same. But if you have the opportunity, what you can do is you can adjust the ways that students can, can um, demonstrate their action expression. So if your learning outcome is about content, I could have a student write a paper or I could have them give a presentation and they can still demonstrate that knowledge. Um, they can still demonstrate that knowledge, uh, importantly. So uh, like I said, UDL is not about changing your learning outcomes. Instead, it's about being proactive rather than reactive about uh, equity and access and incorporating multiple paths and resources to success. So in this way, you're proactively, again, proactively planning for all students to succeed instead of making exceptions or accommodations. However, this is, this is a really huge task, right? So revamping your entire course to try and promote equity and access is no small task. So what we're gonna introduce you to now is a strategy called the plus one strategy, which hopefully highlights is there just one more way that you can keep learners on task? Just one more way that you can give them information or just one more way that they can demonstrate their skills. So this is a really, uh, I would say, accessible way to incorporate universal design in your classroom, just to think about what's just the one more thing that you can do this, this semester. And that's our, uh, a reflection that we'll leave you with, which is what is one strategy you plan to apply to make your teaching more effective, engaging, and equitable this semester? So apply that plus one strategy to your courses and you can pick one of those strategies that we shared with you today, one that you heard from your colleagues or even one that you saw in the chat. And I'll just note, please don't leave yet. We, we still promise to tell you about our services and our resources, um, so we're not, we're not done just yet.
with that Sarah mentioning that they uh, that she uses chunking in her instruction uh, to allow verbal and visual information access, which is great. So what you'll notice today is that we did some of this. So we we integrated different activities, we integrated different pauses and reflections. And that's a really great way uh, to ensure that folks aren't getting overloaded, getting that cognitive overload that Shen mentioned at the beginning. So I love that you do that in your class, Sarah, um, and I'm sure your students appreciate it. All right, so I think other folks, uh, if you'd like to, you can feel free to share uh, that one strategy or your, your plus one uh, for the semester as we go into talking just a little bit about our services and the resources that we provide at here at CTRL. And I believe Anna is taking this first. All right, everyone. So thank you for sticking with us through this rather long, but um, highly informational session. Um, and we're going to share with you how else you might interact with us throughout the semester. Um, so we offer consultations, events and workshops, and online resources, and we'll go into a little bit more detail about each of these. So starting with our services, like our consultations. Um, so we offer one-on-one -on -one consultations uh, on anything related to teaching. So it could be course design, instructional strategies, gathering feedback on your teaching, even building a teaching portfolio. And then as was mentioned, um, towards the start of the session, someone had asked about our mid-semester course analysis service, which is where we facilitate a conversation with students in your class to gather and compile formative feedback on your teaching. And then we meet with you to discuss the results and any possible changes you want, might want to make um, to your course. Um, but we also can consult with you about if you want to design your own survey to gather feedback from your students. Let uh, Matt can talk about our events that we do. Sure, so throughout the semester, um, well, throughout the year, we hold a few large uh, events. So we hold a few conferences. We're still kind of in the middle of our August faculty workshops. We still have one day left tomorrow. So we encourage you all to attend if you have the ability to. Shed mentioned that great session on trauma-informed teaching uh, that I'm sure will be super valuable. Um, we also do the Ann Farron Conference, which is in January, at, uh, which is uh, focused on faculty sharing their perspectives, research, and uh, experiences with teaching to the broader AU community. And then finally, we do May Faculty Workshops, where these are kind of longer, more intensive uh, workshop sessions to get you prepared for the fall semester. So we do them in May intentionally so that you have all summer to apply the things that you learned in these uh, May Faculty Workshops. We also do a variety of other workshops and events, such as various teaching and learning workshops that you'll see uh, advertised throughout the uh, semester. We're relaunching a series on critical perspectives on teaching and learning with the help of our inclusive pedagogy fellows. Our research uh, team here at CTRL does research method talks. And then as needed, we have various events with campus partners um, to address and uh, get at any of the campus needs that come up. And then finally, we also have a course design institute that I will talk about a little bit more um, in depth. So this is an institute that we do once or twice a year. Um, we will have one again in the fall. And this is a series of four workshops that's designed to help you learn and also plan a course. So if you haven't had any course design uh, experience, this is for you. If you have had course design experience, this is also for you. This will give you a foundation in course design, an expanded teaching toolkit, various resources, time, and support from CTRL, as well as from your colleagues, and also really valuable interactions with your colleagues. Um, you can see on the right there, the different sessions uh, and the focus of those different sessions. So we talk about course design frameworks, learning outcomes and summative assessment, formative assessment and grading practices, and creating student-centered learning environments. And I want to read you off a quote from one of our participants um, who shared that this was, and I quote, tremendously valuable in fostering community engagement and effective designs, plus highly useful and evidence-based tools. A second quote is, uh, if you have never learned about course design, you need this course. If you have never learned about it, but are unsure, you need this course. If you already know, but want to refresh, you need this course. So these are coming straight from our faculty participants. 
and hopefully you can join us in the fall. Um, our first date will be October 11th and you will get another email about that. So you don't necessarily have to decide right now whether or not you want to um, participate. And I'll pass it on to Shed to talk about some of our resources. Thanks, Mac. And I, if I can add something about the CVI, I like to think of it as, you know, if you've ever said, I, I want to learn more about syllabus design, but I need someone to just trap me in a space and, and make me learn about it for a while and, and, and give me feedback and let me talk to people about it, that's the place to be. So if you always intended to do that kind of work or learning, but never had the time, that is the opportunity. Um, so, of course, we have actually very expansive online resources that we encourage you to check out, such as a syllabus guide, a downloadable syllabus template. We have uh, insights from our student partners. Hannah mentioned earlier how our student partners have done expansive projects uh, and offer a lot of wonderful insight about what it's like to learn uh, in their position and what they recommend to us as instructors. We've got The Beat, which is an online publication where our faculty faculty and staff contribute writing. Um, they contribute short articles about their teaching experiences. And our last issue that just came out was about uh, equity, I believe, specifically focusing on equity inclusion. Great issue. Um, we have teaching portfolio guides for those of you who are working on your teaching portfolios, which theoretically is supposed to be all of you all the time, always, but we understand you have other stuff to do. And other topics that we have on our online resources include a lot about accessibility, course design, and inclusive and equitable teaching strategies. So we have a lot of things for you to look through, and we encourage you to, again, um, seek out those resources. All right. Uh, I, can, I can wrap us up if we like. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. We know this was a long session, so we really appreciate that you stuck with us and engaged. If you would like to speak with us more, um, our contact information is at the bottom. If you would like to do a consult and talk about some of your course questions or materials, then we would love to speak with you. There's the link Hannah's just put in the chat. Uh, our upcoming events are on our calendar at the second link, and our resources are linked there. Third, we love to hear from you. You're not bothering us. So uh, please do get in touch. Um, and we will support you uh, as much as we can. And thank you, Tom, for the compliment. And we could stick around for a minute for, uh, oh, are, we're transitioning to our next thing, or is this the last thing of the day? Yeah, we are transitioning, but you okay. could, you're welcome to stay. I'm just going to make a really quick announcement. First of all, thank you okay. all. Uh,